So good evening. Um, it's uh, six o'clock um, Eastern time, but it's midnight here in Switzerland. I'm Alexander Migani. I'm one of the panelists of the Virtual Global Spine Conference, and I'm happy to see you all here again uh, to the uh, today's session of uh, classification in scores. Um, from, from our faculty and panelists, I see uh, Michael Galgano is online and Mike Salvi from Australia. And, and today will be um, a little bit different um, because um, I will open uh, interactivity models um, for, for all of you um, participants who are listening and watching this, uh, this conference. And I will, I will tell you um, uh, exactly um, what is different today. So um, I always wanted to talk a little bit about classification in scores. And um, the difficulty is um, that they're really complex. And um, uh, the, the most used we do is like the clicks uh, uh, or the AO spine uh, thoracolumbar injury score. Uh, everybody knows these, um, but we are um, dealing with a lot of more um, um, scores and classification systems. And I just wanted to uh, run through some cases and ask you all to uh, participate when my screen is working. So um, these are my disclosures. They are not related to any of these topics. And I, I picked my, my, um, my cases like 10 years ago. Oh, these are old, um, old cases. And um, I just wanted to show you these. Um, you find a lot of old implants. Uh, don't laugh. Um, it was the time where minimal invasive surgery was not really <clears throat> present here. Um, so it's a little bit of a journey into the past again. So the interactivity mode um, today is um, uh, just on, on Zoom, but um, you can uh, pick up your smartphone if you're um, uh, holding it in your hand and you can use this QR code and uh, scan it. Um, or you can go to um, the internet uh, webpage um, www.menti.com and you just don't only have to enter the um, code which is written here. So it's easiest uh, for you who has got a smartphone, Android or um, iPhone, whatever you want. You just have to um, uh, click on this um, QR code and then you are in the interactivity session and you don't have to fill in any name. This is completely anonymous. It's not related to this um, Zoom. Nobody will know and nobody will see what you are answering. And this is only for us um, and it's, it works pretty fine. And it's very popular here in the conferences in Europe in the last um, weeks and month. And uh, it's really great. It's opening uh, the, um, um, the uh, virtual sessions uh, to, to everybody who's listening. So um, <clears throat> the, the first question, and if you now look at your smartphone, you should see also this image and um, you, can, you can answer the, the, the smartphone. You can see here, I, I put it here <clears throat> on my screen and you can just answer um, what kind of myodine grade is this? Um, and is, uh, <laughs> I think this is one of the easiest um, uh, starters. Um, because um, everybody knows the myodine classification, or is somebody else using a different classification on this uh, on this uh, in our spine community? Um, Dr. Baj Ali, may I ask you? Hey, good good, uh, good afternoon and good evening, Alex. Thank you for uh, for doing this uh, really interesting uh, session today. Um, no, I, I would say the Meyerden classification and, and or the grading is, is probably the most uh, commonly one used at, at, at least here uh, for degenerative uh, for degenerative spondies. Um, I, I will say I think you probably would agree with me that a lot of times it's like not one or two, but it's 1.5 or we say one to two, uh, especially if it's dynamic, because sometimes if it's a dynamic spondy, it can go from one to two. So uh, uh, but but you know I, I think you're right. I think Meyerding is probably what what certainly I'm familiar with and what most people I know use. Yeah, great. Yeah, um, so let's hurry to the next image. So this is Meyerding grade. Yes, I think half of the uh, participants say three, 
uh, the others say um, a two or a one. Uh, now let's have a look to this one. Um, what might in great is this? You can see this is now an isthmic um, with a spondylolysis. Um, the first one was a degen um, spondy. Now this is an isthmic. Uh, what kind of amide grade is this? The same question, the same classification system. And um, I, I think <laughs> The, 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 the thing that um, uh, Dr. Barge mentioned is really important. So this is the um, reflection X-ray. I um, cropped the image a little bit, uh, but this was on, on flexion. So it's um, this um, many, uh, the majority says it's um, grade um, three, um, uh, but uh, you have to measure. You know, so for this classification, you have to measure. Sometimes uh, you find the posterior wall of S1 uh, really um, easily. Sometimes it's hard because of the iliac crest and osteoarthritis, um, but um, it's a measurement. You know? So um, when we do our classifications, we all want to have a binary system. You know? Like, is this good or is this bad? Is this uh, when you get an email, if it's if it's spam or is it not spam? You, you want a binary mode, um, good or bad, yes or no. And when we have a grading system like one, two, three, four or five, we have to measure. And um, so this makes um, a grading or classification system a little bit more difficult. So again, for, for all the um, um, folks who uh, joined a little bit later, this is an interactive case discussion today. Uh, you can all vote and just um, scan this QR code or go to the web page menti.com and enter this eight digit um, code. It's always written uh, um, on, the, on the top of the presentation during the whole session. So <clears throat> my question to you is this, um, what about classifications? Do we, do we really need them or is this um, some for academic spine surgery? Is this for science and research or these classifications or do we always use them because they are widespread but really we don't need them? Like a myodine classification. Uh, Ali, would you change your uh, operative or your surgical procedure whether it's a myodine two or three? Uh, yeah, you know, Alex, I mean, I would, uh, you know, everybody has different comfort level with uh, the type of uh, uh, fixation or, 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 or inner body fusion, I think, you know, like, for example, a grade one or two, maybe, you know, I, I'm comfortable doing that with it in a, with a T lift, but if it's grade three or more, I probably wouldn't do an inner body. Um, and I think it's very important at the lumbosacral junction, if again, it's grade one, it was like that case you showed, if it's grade one, two, or even three, you, you can probably consider doing an A lift. But once you get to grade four or spondyloptosis, then it's probably really hard to do anything from the front. I, I think the grading does affect uh, the management, but it's dependent. It's surgeon dependent. So every surgeon looks at that and decides on that in her or, or his own uh, uh, way, in my opinion. Yeah, and, but the thing with spondyloptosis is this is a binary. Yeah? This is grade five, yes, but is is a spondyloptosis or not? Is this yes or no? This is this is one of these um, new things we always look like in the TL classification of injuries. Yeah? Is there an alignment? Is there a luxation or not? We just say C. But this is so easy to make these classifications. And um, I, um, I'm looking interesting to this um, to these bars because um, I think there is um, many many really say this is a, in my daily practice. It's I need them, uh, and some say I cannot live without. Um, obviously the. When you have a bar which is like um, no peak, then um, any answer is uh, is given. Um, and um, I think many say uh, we have too many. We should focus more. So let's run to some cases. Um, <clears throat> the first one is this. Um, it's an 80 year old patient. He was just falling at home. Uh, an unlucky step um, and uh, he had neck pain, he was awake um, and he had no neurological deficit. 
And you see here, uh, we have got a combined uh, injury of uh, C1 and C2. It's a four part um, atlas fracture and we have got a um, odontoid fracture as well. So this is another image, uh, four images, you see them here. Um, it is um, really um, hard now uh, when it comes to decision making. You know, when we always have a only have an odontoid fracture, we can discuss a, a whole session uh, what to do. Uh, but I picked up this case because this is a combined fracture, and um, I just wanted to ask you um, when you go here or you scan the QR code again, uh, what would you do? Um, would you go and you can the bar is you can say a strongly or uh, disagree strongly with the posterior um, fixation C12 on okay this is a combined injury C1 C2 I have to go to the occiput um, uh, some will say okay I will do this combined um, uh, anterior screw and posterior fixation or some say okay no it is um, a conservative treatment it's a color and uh, maybe um, you give your opinion about a halo traction. Does, does anybody uh, want, want to take over what he would do from the panelists or from, uh, from the hosts? Alex, I'll, uh, I'll chime in on that. I know Mike Selby and Gogan are here as well, but just real quick. So it, in, in my personal opinion, I think when we see these C2 uh, fractures, I feel like a lot of the surgical decision-making is based on that, not necessarily on C1. C, to me, I haven't seen a C1 fracture that's so much worse than a C2 when they're, when they're together, if you will, right? So my decision is always probably based on what's going on at C2. And I'll tell you, if I'm treating that conservatively, then you know it's very rare that a C1 fracture is going to change my mind. In fact, I'll probably be more, you know, leaning more towards conservative therapy. Um, otherwise, and you know, I don't want to steal the whole show here, but otherwise, you know, I don't have a problem doing an OC fusion. Um, I know a lot of people say, well, in the elderly, it's very morbid and et cetera, et cetera. Talk to these patients. A lot of them do not, do not have much mobility to begin with from this extreme spondylosis and arthritis. So I don't have a problem with that, but you're right. We can spend a whole session on OC fusions and you know pros and cons. But for me, that's a conservative. Uh, that I'll treat that conservatively. Yeah, and um, I didn't start with the uh, thoracolumbar injury because we have got this TL classification from Vaccaro for years, and uh, I picked up this because it's the really. But I think it's really new and it's not so common. The AO spine upper cervical classification now it's like four or five years old. Um, and it is an attempt to combine all these injuries because AO spine has to deliver a classification system for the whole spine. And now it's upper uh, cervical, it's it's like all in one and um, they try to unify all these different classification systems, but it's a disruption of our old and we are all conservative. We, we like to use all this stuff. We are trained um, for, for 20 years or for, for 15 years. Um, but who is familiar with the AO spine upper cervical classification system? This is my question to you. Um, uh, in the odontoid fracture classification, um, which one do you prefer, the Anderson D'Alonso or the new Auspang? I, I mean, look at this. Um, where is the odontoid fracture here? You can see it, it's hidden in uh, um, section three, uh, C2 and C23 joint. And there you find all these odontoid fractures, all of them in this um, type A. And it's not type B, it's not type C. Um, so it is uh, really um, getting lost, uh, the differentiation between type two and type three from Anderson D'Alonso. And I'm really not happy with this, but I just want to ask you, um, what are you using here in this 80 year old male patient? Um, do you combine these um, into this upper cervical new or do you use uh, the older ones? Uh, in Europe, Gewehler is very, very uh, frequent used and, and Jefferson for the four part fracture as well. And this is a four part fracture. Um, you can, you can um, um, rank what is the one you, you would 
use first? Is this still Jefferson? Would you say Jefferson fracture, or do you say it's Gewala type three? Would you say just four part fracture, or would you use the um, AL spine UC2 type A classification? Um, this is really um, difficult for for uh, for all of us um, to um, to mention, but I'm uh, I'm conservative, so I like this old stuff. Um, for me, it's still a Jefferson fracture, and um, this is um, perhaps it's um, it's too difficult, but it's um, <clears throat> this is really something what the AO spine has to face with their classification system that we are. Um, in love with Anderson D'Alonso, or is anybody else using a different classification system for odontoid fractures? Ali, do you use a different one? You just stick to Anderson D'Alonso, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we stick to that. Again, it's probably you know regional, certainly here in the U.S. At least for the neurosurgeons in the crowd. Uh, I mean, that's like neurosurgery spine 101 and we get asked about that on the boards written boards oral boards i don't yeah. see us getting away from that anytime soon yeah me either yeah and i say always jefferson fracture here in switzerland um i don't use this new one um and it's really hard to to go over so um, the same uh, would be like anderson and alonso and i think here everybody will uh, stick to anderson and alonso um, <clears throat> when I um, ask you for decision making, um, many said conservative with the collar. Um, do you, is is this Anderson D'Alonso or the the Atlas fracture classification? Is this helpful in decision making? Uh, and Dr. Baj mentioned that it's uh, talk to the patient. Look, what are their expectations? What do they want to do? Um, are they still active doing their sports? Um, is age? still a number. Uh, I, I know Mike Selby is there and Mike Selby is always saying age is not a factor. Uh, but what about ASAR classification? Do you listen to your anesthetists? Do you consult them before a surgery and ask, uh, is ASAR score important or not? And I just <laughs> wanted to, to mention this ASAR classification because this is really important. Um, we have five types um, and uh, we all use ASA, but maybe we don't understand ASA classification really, because when we, uh, when we ask the patient, uh, you see one or two in elective surgeries, and then he says, no, he's three or she is three, then, oh, she's ill. But what about four? Um, who performs surgery in ASA four? What does four mean? Uh, and you see from the definition from the American Society of Anesthesiology, it's a severe systemic disease that is life threatening. And if you have got a patient with a uh, herniated disc and um, she is uh, complaining of pain, um, but no motor weakness, nothing, would you do surgery in a patient with a life threatening condition? Um, for ASA 5, I can tell you our anesthetist will not allow a patient with a herniated disc to go into surgery when he is age of five. This is unethical, uh, will not work. Um, and so let's have a look here. This is an ASA classification uh, um, for risk stratification uh, in adult spinal deformity. And look what a difference it makes whether you are ASA 3 or ASA 4. Um, uh, complication, right? Any complication goes up to um, 52%. And believe me, this is not the, the whole truth. If you look deeper, maybe you're not at 50%, maybe you're at 80 or 90% because uh, venous trump embolism, you have to look after, you have to scan everybody um, to, to rule out um, uh, venous trump embolism. If you just screen when they have symptoms, uh, you end up like four or five percent, but there are these silent trump embolism and they are there and maybe they are clinically inapparent in the hospital stay or on the first 30 days, um, but they can have an impact in the, in the patient's life, a pulmonary a failure after three months, uh, after six months, um, just have a look, ASA classification, ask your anesthetist 
what kind of ASA class is your patient and you will feel comfortable when he's one or two or you think, oh, three or four, this is hard. And this is adult spinal deformity. And you can see from the number in um, ASA class four, they performed um, 80, 86, 90% uh, patients in ASA 4, and this is really hard. Our anesthetists will not say, uh, will, will not be uh, happy when I send always ASA 4 patients. And the risk of dying is like 25% in ASA 4. This is a very important classification system, I guess. It's not spine surgery related, it's not um, uh, spine specific, but it's really important. And this is interdisciplinary, pure interdisciplinary communication. If you don't perform ASA by yourself, ask your anesthetist. And I think this is really important. So um, this patient I've shown with ASA 1 and um, uh, with atlas and uh, odontoid fracture, uh, the anesthetist told me he is ASA 4 because of his um, comorbidities, um, severe, um, he was uh, really in a bad condition uh, before, and, and now he is ASA4. Uh, what would you do? So this is not the hypothetical um, um, discussion, uh, how to do it, just now you have ASA4. Uh, this patient, he's, uh, he's awake, uh, you can talk to him, um, and um, this um, uh, combined uh, fractures there. Um, just um, let, me, uh, let me say, the decision-making is always uh, the patient. She says yes or no, we all know this. Um, but when you go to the patient with the information that he is ASA1, um, it, it is really completely different what I am um, recommending than when he is ASA4. Um, and um, I think the... <clears throat> The, the biggest um, amount now goes to conservative. And uh, let me tell you um, uh, what was the curse of this patient. Um, he was admitted to emergency uh, department and um, on admission, his um, blood um, sample was elevated on CRP on admission. Um, it was a urinary, urinary infection. Um, and on day one, um, the, uh, the lab called us and said, uh, he has got gram-negative gram uh, sepsis and the patient was dead on day two of admission. So it was um, a rapid decline. And um, when we discussed this case in our team, um, we, um, we were asking ourselves, um, uh, would we have done um, everything right or not? And I'm sure uh, these um, cases should not be performed on day one on admission. Don't do this length of stay as short as possible and run into the OR. One day awaiting can be really crucial. On the other side, we have got a lot of literature who says early management is better. But if I did perform surgery on day one and the patient would have been dead on day two, um, I really uh, would have done um, it wrong. And nobody would say, oh, that's a luck, uh, unlucky situation. It's not your fault. It, it, it would have been um, a really ignorance of uh, the anesthetist um, opinion that they classified the patient to ASO4. So um, do, do you use any other risk stratification, uh, stratification tools in your daily clinic? You can, you can just um, type in whatever you want um, into this field on, on your screen, and then we can, we can discuss it. Um, the first one who says yes, uh, I, would, I would love to hear what kind of risk um, stratification you are using. Um, just type in what kind of score, what kind of classification. Um, uh, meanwhile, I would love to, to hear the, um, uh, the opinion of anybody else. Um, uh, have you got a hint, um, a tip? Uh, what, uh, what kind of score should I do on the emergency room? Is this a frailty score or is just, this a... Is this for elective cases or for um, like or emergencies or traumas? Both, both elective, elective and emergency. I don't yeah. know whether you 
you, you differ in your um, daily practice. Um, for, for us, we do several um, screenings and our internal medicine is helping us um, when we treat our patients. So the patient is sent to the um, emergency room and then he goes to the ward and he's labeled like this is a spine surgery patient, he's got a spinal injury or spinal disease, but nevertheless, internal medicine is taking a closer look to our patients. And we live this interdisciplinary approach and it's really good. They have a beautiful brains, uh, which are much powerful than my one alone. And they find so many things out. Um, I'm Maybe I'm neglecting, I'm not uh, taught, and they're doing very well. And um, so <clears throat> um, I, will, I will come to this question later. So um, um, this is the second case. Um, <clears throat> this is a patient um, who was performed. Okay, I will I will go here. No, this is a patient who was performed uh, ACDF, um, and he had neck pain two years later. Um, and um, we find this um, X-ray, and you can see there are broken screws. You can see. Um, a solid union in the upper segment, um, but you don't see a solid uh, union in the lower segment. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, there's a slight missing, sorry for this. Um, when, you, when your sus suspicion of a, a non-union, um, what kind of um, uh, procedure would you love to do? Um, would you say that a flexion extension X-ray is useful? Would you say SPECT is useful? Or would you say MRI? I see everything on MRI um, <clears throat> or CAT scan. Or do you say, um, in my experience, I can see non-union on play X-ray? Um, so I <clears throat> am now here in spine surgery for, for two decades. And I was taught to, to look on CAT scan. So um, 20 years ago, I would have said um, CAT scan. Uh, and I think Wendy, if she was, would be here, she would say, no, you can see everything on MRI. Um, and um, we are really um, having lots of uh, examinations in SPECT. And I can see this is a nice um, result. Um, many say that flexion extension is very useful, like CAT scan, uh, what I mentioned. Um, and SPECT is, some say SPECT, yes, uh, but many say no, not useful. So what do we do in a university hospital? We do everything. Yeah. This is without, we are no-brainers. We do MRI and we do a SPECT. And um, you can see uh, these uh, images are now 11 years old. Uh, these are my old cases from, uh, from, uh, um, from a decade ago. And um, you can see nicely what you can, if you're lucky, you can see on SPECT a solid fusion two years post-op in the upper um, segment and uh, a lousy uptake in the lower segment. And let's have a look to the MRI. <clears throat> uh, uh, I would love to hear Wendy whether she says, yes, you can see here the same, <clears throat> but I don't. Um, <clears throat> have you ever heard about a bone fusion grading system, a classification of uh, non-union? Have you ever heard about um, how to grade these in a classification system? We have so many, many papers who say, okay, bony fusion was seen and examinated one year follow up on CAT scan or X-ray. But do we measure this? Do we classify these? Do we grade these? Or is this just like, ah, uh, I think it's fused. Um, Dr. Baj, Ali, how many papers did you do? Did you publish where you look for fusion rate? Yeah, that's a good question, Alex. I mean, I, I think I'm guilty of not, not doing that that much, uh, not because it's not important. Obviously, it's extremely important. Um, but I think if you're going to publish a paper that is, and you're looking at the, as one of the primary outcomes is uh, fusion or you know successful fusion, you have to be able to uh, document that you either measured the degree of bone bridging, the location, morphology on CT, or, uh, you know, it depends. It depends, on, it depends on reviewer number two and if they want to be nice or not. But sometimes you can say based on x-ray was adequate or 
flexion extension x-rays didn't show any mobility. But I think I know traditionally, really, the, the, you, you had to almost measure this on x-ray or, or CAT scan. Um, if your primary outcome is, is fusion. Now, obviously yeah. in these papers, a lot of our primary outcomes is, you know, is patient outcomes, clinical outcomes. Um, and, then, and then you look at complications, hardware failure, PJK, PJF. Um, I'm seeing a little bit less, uh, uh, you know, manuscripts that, that primarily focus on fusion as an outcome. That's just, for, you know, what I'm, yeah. what I'm seeing. I don't know yeah, about what your experience is in Europe. We have so many happy patients with a non-union, you know. Um, and in a clinical practice, if you look, um, you have got to follow up. Um, do you take your time and measure it if it's not in a in a in a study, or um, do you just say, okay, clinical history, clinical presentation is much more important, and I I leave the examination of the radiological findings in this um, in this depth. So, um, Alex, can, I ask, can I ask a question back to you? Yeah. Um, because you know, I, I'd like to know how how you handle this. So this question comes up not infrequently in in, in clinic when you let's say three yeah. months out, you know, you get the, the X-rays in clinic, X-rays look good, and the patient asks you, well, you know, uh, is it fused or is it fusing? Right. I mean, I've, I've, I'd love your opinion. I know Dr. Birchik is here and others. Please write in the chat box what you think or what you tell patients when they tell you that. I mean, you kind of need a CAT scan to definitively tell when there's fusion, but usually I tell my patients, well, indirectly, we know you're healing because the x-rays don't show any loosening or abnormalities, but that's always a tough one to answer in, in, my, in my personal opinion. You know, hey, am I fused yet or am I fusing? And it's only three to six months out, right? Alex, how do you, how do you take care of that question with your patients? Yeah. It's, it's, it's really good and that you're asking it. It's like the same, what is the value of post-op X-ray if the patient is fine? Um, you, you, we have got beautiful papers and they were looking at how high is the percentage of revision surgery when the patient is fine and the radiograph is looking mm, suspicious or bad. And it was exactly 0%. Yeah? So it was a, from, from, uh, from the US, from New York. And I love this paper so much because we are doing an amount of unnecessary X-rays and unnecessary um, um, CAT scans. And uh, I stick to the clinical presentation. A happy patient um, should not be over-examined. Um, but for all these controls, when I do a different technique, um, like a CBT, cortical uh, bone trajectory, uh, I will use CAT scan um, for, uh, for follow-up. This is some kind of... Um, uh, examination you can you can stone me for this um, but I just want to know um, is this a, a, a good technique or not um, uh, and um, the the patients are told by me if they are fine uh, we don't have to do anything else um, and I stick to the clinics I just wanted to, to mention these because it's new. Um, Patil and Boehm from Nottingham in England, they um, um, set up this grading system. And I think it's it's nice to know um, for all these um, uh, guys and uh, colleagues who, who wanna do some studies uh, that we can grade these. Um, and um, in this case, um, I've, I've shown here, I go back to the, to the image sorry, um, this image, what would you do? Um, I would love to hear your opinion. What would you do? Um, just wait a minute um, here. Um, what, what would you do? Uh, would you go and revise this uh, patient from, from interior and uh, put in some graft inside um, <clears throat> the lower segment? What would you do from posterior? Would you say, okay, I, I, I treated conservative two years. It's not so much, I can wait can still fuse in the future? Or would you say, okay, mm, no, I will send the patient to the pain specialist because he has got no neuro um, deficit. So uh, um, this is uh, my question to you. I'm just waiting a little bit longer that more people can vote. And- Alex, um, this is for the, for the pseudoarthrosis and the, and the fractured yes. screw ACDF case? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The two broken yeah, I think screws. We'll, we'll see what the results show. I, I think the um, one important point, which I know you're, you know, you're going to cover, is that 
um, it's one thing to find a radiographic non-union or a hardware fracture, if you will, but ultimately we're treating patients and if, you know, it really depends what the clinical scenario is like, if they're having new neck pain, new neurological deficits, but that's why I think the answer to your first question, I think I like CAT scan to determine non-union or pseudoarthrosis, but it, but whether the patient needs surgery or not, I think that's where I invoke additional studies like dynamic x-rays, MRI. I, I think those two are obviously overlap, but sometimes they can be mutually exclusive. Yeah, for me, it's the most important is, was the patient in a good condition in the first three months, six months, and then it was a secondary worsening the happy patient turning into an unhappy patient. This switch is very important. If the patient was bad from the beginning and he was not getting better and he was staying in pain for all the time, then it's hard for me to uh, recommend a surgery. But this patient was a little bit, of, uh, was fine. And I just wanted to ask you uh, hypothetical, what, what would you do? Um, and I see here um, from interior, the majority would disagree to go from interior, um, would say, okay, from posterior. And uh, those who know me, um, um, I will, um, <clears throat> uh, I would just before we go to the OR, I would ask you uh, which scores would you love to see from this patient? Um, um, this is the um, the X-ray. Sorry, this, the the order was wrong. Um, uh, what what scores would you like to have for this patient? And we have um, hmm, uh, sorry, this is um, is missing. Um, ho hoping, I'm hoping. Uh, so this is a post-op um, result. Sorry about the the order. This is my my post-op uh, result, and um, there was there's just the classification missing. I can't tell you any score or any classification that helps me in decision-making. It's just clinical presentation and history. And this is unclassifiable for me. And the scores that we have, like the, um, the NAS score cervical, um, this is a NAS cervical, uh, this is not helping me for decision-making. And when we have the other cervical score, um, like the SF, uh, uh, this is not cervical, uh, the JOA score for myelopathy, this is really not, uh, not helpful because the patient has not a functional deficit like this. So we have many scores and I can, um, I can take any score, but in the end, it's this decision-making um, that we have to do. Um, and for me, in this case, um, I, I couldn't, um, uh, there was no um, help from any available system. So I'm uh, running a little bit to the next case. <clears throat> this was the, um, the, the one where no um, classification system is helpful. And now I um, show you this one. Uh, this is a, the, the third case uh, is a man who works on a crane. He has to climb up 20 meters um, and he's looking from above always down like he's he's actually he has got the position we have as spine surgeons we are looking always down and he was working on a crane and um he had um severe chronic neck pain um he was unable to work um left uh, c7 um pain and um <clears throat> so this is his mri and um, he is really young, 39 years. For me, it's young. Um, and uh, he has got a sensory loss in the upper extremities and the hand pain. And we find this um, MRI. Um, <clears throat> and um, you can see these both, uh, the foraminal uh, component here. Um, it's a, a herniated disc. It's a pre-existing stenosis. It's three level. Um, it's um, for me. It was not easy. It was like uh, 11 years ago, and I learned a lot from this case. Um, so this is a CAT scan. You can see the posture. Um, he was not able to recline uh, the head, so he was lying in the CAT scan uh, with this uh, flexed C spine, and uh, you can see the osteophytes pre-vertebral. You can also see the retro um, vertebral osteophytes the spurs. Um, and uh, um, the um, actual scan, you can see the first on the left is the upper, the middle is the middle, and the lower is the right axial. Uh, you can see these um, uh, bony spurs. 
and uh, um, I would love to, to hear from you uh, which score, which classification would you like to have pre-op? Um, this is a patient with a myopathy. Um, he has neck pain. And um, is, this, uh, is there anything you can uh, you do in your clinical practice? Not in academic spine, in your clinical practice. Um, and what, what would you do in this case? I can skip back to the images if you want. Um, and um, I put up five scenarios, you know, like uh, the one who is doing anterior only in these cases, the one who is doing posterior only in these cases, or the one who is doing combined, but posterior first and um, anterior second or anterior second and posterior first. Or is there anybody who would say, um, I manage everything um, conservative in this patient, um, I, I, um, I'm able to, um, to do this. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, many say um, that they will do it uh, from interior. Um, you can a uh, little bit adjust it if you, if you want to strongly agree or you say um, I strongly disagree. Um, <clears throat> I, I love to see that um, posterior first, anterior second is not getting any vote um, to strong agree. Um, but I was taught in, in, from, my, from my head, if you have got a severe stenosis of the C-spine, if you do laminectomy first, um, you help the patient a lot for myelopathy, for neurological deficits, and you can do anterior second. Um, so this was the, um, um, the, the first thing I learned in spine surgery. So you can see here, um, some say anterior only, this is really a, um, a good um, uh, attempt or anterior first, uh, posterior second, uh, and the rest gets no votes. So um, let me say, this patient uh, who was presented um, in our hospital, um, it was not elective case. He, he was sent to us uh, as an emergency uh, because of his pain and his uh, neurological deficit. It was 12 years ago. Uh, the patient became agitated, disoriented, and confused. And um, in, in Basel, University in Basel, we do um, screen every patient not the doctors, not the internal medicine uh, doctors, but the nurses. The nurses have got this tool. This is a delirium observation screening tool and the scale and they screen everybody and they screen everybody uh, two times um, a day um, if um, they are looking, uh, if there is suspicion of uh, getting a delirium. So, um, Delirium in hospitalized patients is really a common problem, usually in the geriatric, in the older uh, population, but it is also uh, present in the younger ones. And nobody expected a delirium in a 39-year-old patient. And I show you some, show you some data, but it's a rising problem. If you if you have a look, um, how many percent of patients are getting delirium? Um, and have got um, a, a, a problem from the delirium. Um, it is uh, correlated with age. Um, you, the older you get, the higher is your risk. Um, but you see there's a, a little bit of difference between men and women in the population between 20 and 50 years. Um, and it's really um, lengthening uh, length of stay. It is um, the pneumonia rate is getting high. The mortality is getting high. Um, it is really important to, um, to detect delirium as early as you can do. And we do this with these DOS, um, this uh, delirium um, uh, score um, and the nurses do these because the nurses are where the patient is every day and you can see here uh, what are the parameters and I like this score very much and I always ask is there a change of the uh, observation screening um, scale in this patient when he's getting like confused or sleepy uh, when the answers are, are getting bad and I think this is a very important um, score or scale um, um, and you can you can see here psychomotor activity, uh, pulse IV tubes, feeding tubes, catheters, etc. 
how often you go to the hospital and to the ward and then the nurses tells you, oh, the patient has torn away all these um, catheters and IV tubes, it's a mess, blood everywhere. This may be, uh, yes, okay, um, it's a lot of work for you, but it can also be the first sign of a delirium. So um, day seven, after lots of medication, the patient was fully adequate. And uh, what I did, it was anterior. Um, and I, I did this um, corpectomy um, of the lower end. Um, you can see some spurs still remained. I was very unhappy with my result. And I show it here uh, because um, it, it, was, it was not so, so good performed. Um, but the patient was fine until um, post-op he um, deteriorated a little bit, um, motor weakness, left hand. And you can see here some kind of hematoma. The radiologist said it was hematoma. Today, 10 years later, with lots of experience, I'm not sure whether this is a hematoma or not. Uh, could be a usual post-op um, MRI. Um, so um, my question to you now is, I wanted to do anterior only, um, and now I have a patient who is not doing well. Um, <clears throat> the scores were dropping. Uh, the, you can easily score these patients every day, and um, the motor function was going down, the pain was there, um, <clears throat> the quality of life. And um, what, what is your approach if you're um, having, you're facing an epidural hematoma uh, behind a cage, a graft, what are you doing? Uh, do you do a, a revision surgery from the front, from interior, or do you go to, um, to the opposite um, way and say, okay, I take away the lamina, I do laminectomy uh, from posterior. Uh, if you see these images, you see uh, the hematoma is from interior. Okay, so this is an easy answer. Um, everybody says uh, from posterior. So what did I do? I uh, did it the same, <laughs> what uh, the majority says, I did from posterior, um, uh, add an added fusion um, to make it um, a little bit more um, stable. This is like 11 years ago. Today, I'm, I would be telling me myself, oh, you should have achieved more low doses and more compression, everything like this, uh, but the patient was fine. Next case, um, we have got uh, some minutes left. Um, this is an old patient, uh, you see, uh, 85 years old. He has had a sudden onset of back pain, uh, fever. And again, this is case 10 years ago. Um, and I think this is an easy diagnosis for us. Um, and so this is um, L23, it's a spinal infection. Obviously the history, the blood samples, everything fits together. Um, but I have a question to you. How do you call this disease? Uh, what is your term for this? Is this decitis? Is this spondylitis? Is this a vertebral osteomyelitis? Or do you just say spinal infection because no matter where it is, it is treated the same way with antibiotics? Um, or do you have a, got another, um, uh, another um, term for this? Uh, I, I'm really curious because in Europe, uh, we have so many terms, we have a, got a, a terminology which is really confusing um, because um, some say it's just the disc and the, <clears throat> the pathologists say, no, it's never the disc only. It's uh, always the bone infection. It's a, a bone infection, it's the osteomyelitis. Um, and uh, you can see here nicely, um, uh, who gets the most um, points? It is like decitis or spondylitis, and I, I agree with you because you can see the abscess inside of the disc, but you can also see contrast enhanced in the um, in the end plates. Um, I think it's really um, difficult for us to um, have a um, unified terminology in. In spinal injuries, we are really good because a burst fracture in the US is the same as a burst fracture in, in Switzerland. Uh, but in infection, we have, a, uh, we have got some, uh, something to do. Uh, the terminology is not uh, really easy here because in some hospitals here say it's a vertebral osteomyelitis, like me, I say it's a ver vertebral osteomyelitis, and some say it's a spondylitis. So, um, <clears throat> blood sample was negative, um, CT guided um, was negative. We didn't know what bug it is. 
and uh, internal medicine um, told me, can you please take a, 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 a big sample? And we take always these nasty big needle and um, we go through the pedicle inside the disc through the end plate and we get a lot of bugs here. Um, uh, we get the bugs under treatment um, and um, the bug was found and we managed this patient conservatively. But how do we classify this spinal infection. And here I want to mention this great paper from um, Frederike Schulmig and um, uh, Matthias Pumberger from Berlin in, in Germany. Uh, they won a prize from the German Spine Society because they tried to um, build up a score for spondylitis which means vertebral, aside, uh, vertebral disease, uh, vertebral osteomyelitis, they said all these terms, but they said spondylitis, and they called it SISS, uh, analog to the neoplastic instability scores to the SINs. And it's uh, really, um, I think this could be really a score for the future. Um, just to, to repeat, this is the SIN score. Everybody who does tumor surgery, metastatic, uh, primary bone tumors, uh, knows this SIN score is very um, validated and widespread. Uh, I think everybody knows this. Um, and I think it's so helpful for me uh, to teach my residents, to my attendings, and to for decision making for me. To, when I see, oh, this, the SIN score is 16. Um, I have to do something differently than it was would be six. And they um, um, made an examination of hundreds of patients and they developed this um, CIS score. And uh, you can see these, these are like tumors, uh, like tumor spines, but the etiology is always an infection. But the deformity, the, the mechanical pain can be very similar. Um, and um, they put up this score. You can see it's so simple. If you know the SINs, you can understand the SIS uh, in, in a minute. Um, and I think it's uh, really promising that we can use this score. And I would love to share this. Um, I will put on Twitter uh, the, the website. They are free, they are free access. Um, and um, maybe um, you can use these. Or has anybody else a, a score um, in pedo and knows the score for infections of the spine uh, to use? I, I don't have, and I really um, appreciate this attempt to, to use this. So uh, the next one is um, it's a hard one. Um, <clears throat> so I was a young attending and the patient was uh, um, uh, in a motor vehicle accident, uh, she had an ankylosing spine. This is our um, polytrauma, our whole body CAT scan um, 12 years ago. You see the radiologist try to, um, to make the um, X-ray as soft as possible. But for me, it was really hard to see the injury. The patient uh, was neuro intact and I said, okay, I don't do this surgery uh, at night. And during the night, um, she was worsening. Uh, and so on day one, um, she was ACLC and um, I had to do something. So old implants uh, um, and uh, a lot of bending and this was open surgery. Today it's clear. I would do it combined mineral invasive and, um, and decompression. You see the laminectomy here. Um, and um, the patient um, with the ACLC, um, I think, do we have a better um, classification system like Asia um, you know, on the globe um, where we can um, describe um, a paraplegia um, or a, a tetraplegia, a patient? Has anybody a, a different score who is better, that is better? Ali, do you, do you use Asia score as well? Yeah, Alex. We, so we do. You know, we're we're definitely in in, in neurosurgery and and of course orthopedics as well. When it comes time to you know spending time on the spine service, we do assign age of scores to uh, patients with spinal cord injury. Um, you know, to be honest, with you, some centers are a little bit more uh, dedicated to spinal cord injury. So even the trauma team, the rehab teams they will fill out this sheet completely as part of the patient's record. But I would say for, for the vast majority of us though, it's, you know how it is when they're coming in, right? So it's Asia A, B, C, D, or E. 
and that's the extent of it. And then yeah. we leave it up to either, you know, a dedicated research coordinator or a dedicated, uh, you know, uh, spinal cord injury rehab team to complete the actual scoring. Yeah, I think it's, it's one of the most important. I think it, it is so important to to have a good neurological examination. And on the web page from the um, uh, from the society, um, there's really brilliant PDFs how to uh, examine a patient. If you're really not familiar, you can see your beautiful images uh, how to bend the knee and flex the knee and with the gravity, and, and it's really useful. So um, my my patient um, was doing fine post op, but um, on on day three um, she was um, hypotensive. She had chest pain, and um, obviously we uh, we looked for for a VTE as usual and detected um, patient had a VTE. And um, I want to ask the audience: Is this a, a severe? Is this a major complication, or is it, it's not a major complication. Um, how do you classify this? Um, <clears throat> because everybody is afraid of uh, a VTE, of a Trump embolism. Uh, it's possibly life-threatening. I mentioned it before when I said um, many are clinical inapparent, um, but they are there and can be a problem two months later, three months later, the pulmonary function goes down. And uh, okay, I, I, I see here, it's a major complication. So it's really, um, the, uh, there's nobody saying depends or no. Um, Ali, do you say it's a major complication, the VTE? Yeah, I would say it's a medical complication. Obviously, you know, there's surgical and medical, I would say it's a medical complication. And because it happened post-operatively, you know, especially within the first 30 days, a lot of systems and hospitals will will count that as a as a complication of surgery or related yeah. to surgery. So it is a complication, whether it's major or not. Uh, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest with you, but I would say it's a medical, not a surgical complication. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a surgical complication for sure, but we can classify it. And um, we have got this clavian, dindoclavian classification um, from uh, abdominal surgery. Um, clavian, that's, um, uh, clavian is, a, is a surgeon here in Switzerland, but he is worldwide renowned in the uh, abdominal surgery society. Um, and um, his classification uh, was adapted to spine surgery um, from uh, um, Stulital and Wilhuber from the AO spine, and they tried to uh, validate a, a classification system for a spine surgery. So let me just explain what is this about. Um, the Dindoclavian classification has got five um, grades, and the fifth grade is the patient is dead. Um, and uh, the first one is you're doing only diagnostics yeah so any deviation from normal postoperative curves um like for example a patient has got a tingling in the in the in the leg uh, severe tingling and it's vanishing after 12 hours this would be graded as grade one if you look for it um the grade two is requiring medication yeah like giving any drugs or blood transfusions or uh, parental nutrition, everything, you know, this is the score from abdominal surgery. But they tried to, to um, have this classification for spine surgery as well. Grade three is differentiated into grade 3A and 3B, and it's requiring an intervention, whether it's a surgical or endoscopic or radiographic, whether it's um, you, you do a lumbar drain or you're doing a chest tube, uh, whatever it is, it is um, grade three, and if you do it with local anesthetics, um, you um, it's grade three A or three B if you're doing it uh, under general anesthesia. Grade four is a life-threatening complication requiring intensive care unit management with a single or multi-organ dysfunction is four A and four B. So it's very simple. Yeah. So when you have um, a patient with a myocard infarction on day five, and he's going to a cathedral uh, in local anesthesia, it's 3A. When he has to be on an intensive care um, because of a renal failure, it's 
4A. So it's very easy. And our patient, um, our patient um, was uh, only receiving um, anticoagulants. She was fine. Um, she got her riboroxaban for for three months, uh, six months. Sorry, uh, because it was the standards, um, and um, this was only a medication. And uh, like um, Dr. Baj mentioned, if it's only requiring medication without uh, intensive care, without any other procedure, it's only grade two. So I think these classification systems are really important for us um, that we don't say it's a VTE, it's a major complication by definition. It, I think it depends. It depends whether it's a life-threatening condition or whether it's just taking two pills. And we have several of these um, complications and um, maybe it's it's helpful to use this classification, which is uh, now uh, promoted um, from, from several um, uh, researchers uh, via IELTSpine to look how we can do better and taking away some fears and some myths um, how um, dangerous our surgeries are, because in pneumonia, if you have a pneumonia, a pulmonary complication, sometimes it's just antibiotics and a little bit of coughing, sometimes not, sometimes you're on intensive care. And you, we, we should use a, a better classification system for this uh, to, to have a, a better view to our uh, complications. So thank you very much for your participation. Now we have uh, two minutes after um, whatever <laughs> whatever time it is. And Ali, I, I, I know what is this topic for the next week? Yeah, nice, nice job, Alex. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for this discussion. That was really nice. Uh, yeah, next, so obviously this will be uh, up on YouTube in a few days and uh, uh, everyone can uh, uh, will ref will refer to it if, in case you want to uh, share this with your colleagues. Um, next week, Dr. Goodwin, Matt Goodwin from uh, WashU in St. Louis, uh, is going to have a special guest. Actually, um, it's going to have a special guest to uh, discuss the topic of uh, women in spine surgery and how we can uh, uh, advocate for that and encourage that and uh, basically. Uh, uh, I do not know the name of his guest, but we will find that out and we will put that um, uh, that flyer up on Twitter and, and social media very soon. So uh, Alex, thank you so much for that. And uh, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing everybody next week.